Mm. And Ingrid, sitting in, you're in a, sitting in a different place today. I am. Yeah. I'm yeah. finally in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and then, dare we ask where you were before? Oh, various different spots. It's been, um, as Laura heard last night, it's been, um, yeah, the last two and a half months have been really discombobulating. Mm. What I used, um, but I'm here. So very happy. Good. Thanks. Hey, okay. welcome. Mm. Welcome. Mm. So uh, Carolyn, Carolyn, and I are the faculty for the narrative release program. So um, it'll be too late in the evening for her for the afternoon session, but we have her our morning, her her late afternoon, um, just to. Um, share a bit about the program for next year and uh, answer any of the questions you might have about the program. <clears throat> uh, but I always find it just fascinating to kind of learn what brought you here? Like what is what is um, enticing, attracting um, uh, about the possibility of narrative release? What do you imagine it is or what do you want it to be? Uh, it just gives me a sense of context about how Carolyn and I can <clears throat> best use our time to support you. So. narrative release would be my next step okay. i think id would be number three for me okay um don't know if i'm ready to take that on right now because I'm, I'm needing a rest and I can't stop wanting to be around it and in it. And yeah. uh, seems like a deeper dive into what I experienced in narrative coaching. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. here I be. Here you are. Thank you. I'm here. Uh, to, it looks to me like the narrative release program is is what uh, I'm wanting right now. I'm kind of in the middle of a of an entire reevaluation of my life. There's uh, circumstances have uh, shown me that everything that has gotten me to this point is now not sufficient. So, uh, and I've been I've been uh, had the intention of. Uh, doing narrative coaching uh, for a number of years now. And the reality is that I'm not doing it. <laughs> and the, uh, so the, the, um, the challenge would be to change the mindset because it's not the circumstances. I'm clear on that. It's not mm -hmm. about my circumstances. It's about, it's all about the mindset and about the, well, it's not all, but Circumstances are not irrelevant, but mindset is is critical. So that's that's what I'm here to to look into okay. the possibility of that. Okay. Hmm. Hello, Emma. Hi. Anyone else want to share? Um, yes, um, I'm here um, for narrative release. Uh, I've done the narrative coaching in the ID program, and uh, I'm I just love those two. And now I feel um, that I am in need of some self maintenance, and I can use the, uh, mm. the program for that, and at the same time improve my skills as a mm. as a holder of space and um, coach, mm. whatever the name is. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't think we have a word to describe what we do no. anymore. I <laughs> still haven't found it. All the words feel inadequate. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm. <clears throat> mm. Ingrid? 
Um, so I've been thinking a lot, and I, I wish I could find um, the quote directly, but it was something about um, one that's been sitting with me quite a bit. Um, and, I, and it's not correct, but maybe even the way that I paraphrase it is going to be the way that I've been thinking about it, mm -hmm. um, which is um, there's not any paths. There's just those who are willing to walk or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can't remember exactly how that goes. And I don't even know where that, I know it came from that I saw it with your work mm -hmm. in the um, narrative coaching program. And I can't remember exactly who said it, maybe it was you. Um, but I, <laughs> um, I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, for those of you who are in the narrative coaching program, some of you guys know that I, you know, one of the things I was dealing with personally and I still am, and I say dealing with, I'm not even sure that's the right word, but holding space for is, is um, a son who came home from college and just sort of figuring out how, what and how that means. But also, you know, it's just one thing in many parts of my life is sort of like, mm -hmm. what is, what is the path and what is the one that there is, a, you know, like if there were no mm -hmm. paths, you know, those who are willing to walk, I love, I, I'm sort of wallowing in that a bit, that idea mm -hmm. of it's, it's those first steps. It's that just going out. Um, and, and I think there's a, there has been an invitation to me to think about that more and to not just think about it, but to embody it more and and I don't know if if the narrative releases the place I wanted to go. I actually thought um, that ID was where I wanted mm -hmm. to be, and and yet I didn't have time to go. I didn't have space for the ID program yesterday because I was yeah. I was already committed. Um, but I am also interested in this and even the dis you know just learning more about it. Okay. But it, but um, I think. The other aspect about this is that there is an element of community, conversation, connection, um, the spirituality of it that is appealing mm -hmm. to me, that's drawing me. As I said, the invitation that I am trying to figure out a place and a space for it in my life. So um, that's a lot jumble but i good. think i am pulling some threads out of it for myself good so thank you for asking me to articulate <laughs> you're welcome you're welcome mm. um i'll just add to it ingrid yeah. was saying we had a beautiful mastermind session last our final session last night for the narrative coaching program and we shared our slides, our final slides mm -hmm. again. And um, it was really magical to listen to everybody speak again and add to their stories and how the, the coaching program, narrative coaching program, how everybody, everybody in that group, I think, changed in some way, shape or form by the end of the program. So that intrigues me about narrative release because of the transformate the, the impact that the coaching program had mm. versus actually taking a program that's really going to focus on the person versus what you're doing mm -hmm. um and i if with permission i'd like to share a quote that i found that kind of helps me understand where my head's at with this mm -hmm. it's actually a, a hindu saying and it says when I forget who I am, I serve you. Through serving, I remember who I am and know that I am you. Wow. Yeah. That kind of sums up. Like yeah. is, that, is that the Gita? I'd, I would just say Hindu I saying. So. I don't, is it in the Gita? I think I think it may uh, be. I think one of our faculty just, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go on, Laura. No, it's okay, because last night the word spiritual came up. Um, it was Angelique who mentioned it and when she was sharing her slide and we all kind of went, yep, like it's, there's something happening here. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I had found this saying the other day when I was, I'm, I'm working on my assignment and that kind of 
sum things up for me. And so I'm, I'm like Ingrid, I like, I'm really going back and forth, back and forth between ID and narrative release. And, and there's part of me, like the serving part, the being of service, mm -hmm. I'm leaning towards more work, like the ID part versus the personal part. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, and I, I asked the question the other day with you, David, whether you can do them concurrently, because I just want so much to, mm -hmm. to do this, but then I'm thinking maybe that's cutting a bit too much off at one time. I, I don't know, but so, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm still this, and I'm leaning towards the ID just because I, of the, the being of service, but then being of service to myself is important too. So yeah. it gets very confusing. Mm -hmm. And Robert, I, I love what you said, because I feel very similar in the sense that what got me here was great, but going forward, it ain't going to get me to where I want to go. Thank you for, for acknowledging that. Uh, I have to make a small clarification that uh, what has gotten me here has been great in, in some ways. And in other ways, it has been a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. David, I think, uh, I've interacted with David enough, he may or not remember my story. Mm -hmm. uh, that, um, I came from a, a, a place of, of um, useless human wreckage after 20 years of drug abuse and childhood sexual abuse and emotional neglect and moderate severe ADD. And so uh, the fact that I'm sitting here uh, speaking in a more or less coherent fashion is somewhat of a miracle, but um, that's not enough. And for 35 years, I've been doing 12-step recovery and it's gotten me to a, a wonderful place in many ways, but it's not getting me where I want to be mm. and where I'm sort of trembling on the brink of that... Uh, <laughs> uh, of, of narrative coaching, I completed a narrative coach program several years ago and have not really done much with it. And um, I'm now engaged in a, a conversation of, I'm gonna die, I'm 73. And what is the rest of my life going to be about? Whatever mm -hmm. I have left, it could be five years, it could be 10 years, it could be six months or tomorrow, no way to tell but I have the circumstances I have. And so far, those circumstances have not been advantageous to me. Well, let me correct that. I have not taken advantage of, of the circumstances that so far. Mm -hmm. And that this narrative release, so I've been doing the investigating narrative for about 20, 25 years now. That is, when, when I got into my right mind, after I quit using drugs, uh, or at least began the journey out of my wrong mind, um, it became uh, clear to me that story was crucial, not just important, but pivotal, that it's biological. And that if I don't acknowledge story and move from that rather than the circumstances mm -hmm. I'm wasting my time mm -hmm. so however I do have this strong habit and this strong history of not doing that mm -hmm. so I'm I'm so what um I think what you shared about what I uh, um uh, Laura about uh, not not being where I need to be, but understanding that where I am now is not where I need to be. It's for sure not where I need to be. It, it, unsure about the next step. So I'm already in another program that seems to be working well and a lot of indications from other places that I'm doing fine, except uh, maybe not. So I wanna, I wanna like try to get a little bit more certainty if there is any to be had. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. 
One of the joys I, I appreciate about these programs is that we don't get very many people that rock up and say, hi, I'm here to be a coaching student. <laughs> they sort of wander in with their life as it is, you know, and some parts are working and some are not. And and so I just really want to um, acknowledge this, the hu humanness with which we're coming, all of us today, with lives that kind of work, but maybe don't fully, you know, things kind of in disarray, things in question, beautiful things. Um, yeah, so that's, I really just want to acknowledge that. Um, so Kaylin, is there something that you want to check in with? And then I thought we could maybe talk a bit more about narrative release itself. Mm, yeah, great. Um, yeah, I, I started with NC and then I flowed through ID. Um, and David and I did a version of NR a couple mm -hmm. of years ago and then sat and thought about it last year quite a bit and are very happy to be bringing it in now. In, in January, um, it, 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 when I did it, and thinking, Laura, of what you were saying, and um, someone else saying, and Ingrid, I think it was, these days you have a choice. But when I did it, there was only one route through because of the timing, and Fraukeline was the same. Yeah. So after NC, ID appeared, so we entered that. And then NR appeared and some of us entered that. Now you've got a menu that you could, you might have to have a deep think about. So it's great that you're here to have a think about that route. I would say there's no wrong answer. Mm. No. Um, okay. Well, let, let me just uh, put a couple of things in context and then we'll share more specifically about what the narrative release program is about. Um, so uh, we kind of starting with next year, we're going to highly encourage people who are new to the work to begin with narrative coaching, uh, more overtly encourage them because it's the most well-established. It's the most approachable program in some ways because it has the familiar frame of coaching even though we take a very contrarian view of coaching, it's a frame that most people recognize. Um, and um, so with that then comes from there a choice of, the narrative release program is really the essential sort of spiritual philosophy that underpins all of this work. It's really, there's not gonna be, there's gonna be plenty of learning, but pretty much no teaching. Um, it's really an immersion for you and yourself about um, growing your own capacity to hold space for others. Uh, and, and I'm gonna say briefly about ID that I wanna come back and give you an illustration. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. That's my dog, hang on. Hi, doggy. Yes, we have actually, I don't tell this to most people, but we have a secret class for children and pets of uh, students. <laughs> who, are, who are gleaning, uh, they're now becoming, they're the wisest ones of, the, of them all now because they've been secretly hanging out, listening in on our sessions. Uh, but, um, and, and then so ID is basically being able to scale the principles and practices of narrative coaching in any moment, in any context. Largely it focuses for most people on reimagining training, reimagining consulting, reimagining facilitation, but it's an ability to take the skills and the self into, you know, uh, like I said, uh, reimagining some of we, how things are traditionally done. But I want to give you just sort of a just a really simple example of why um, NR feels important. So some years ago, I was on a when I was um, I think I was living in Australia at the time. And, um, there were there was a, a panel of four sort of thought leader types in the coaching space at a conference. And so they we had this sort of panel where we are, are sort of all reflecting on coaching. And, you know, it was just really, an, it was very sort of traditional of, you know, four chairs up front and the audience up in the little, in the risers and stuff. And there was this, and in this case, they were all men. And there was a point at which one of the uh, women sort of challenged the reality that why were there only men up there? 
And I knew, I knew her well, and she's very brilliant at, you know, and does this kind of, she says these kind of things often, which is great. But what really struck me was uh, I was last, um, and I was the only non Australian in the group, so that's another piece of difference. But all, in my, in my experience, all three of them sort of caved to the question and spent five minutes apologizing. And I, and when it came my turn, I had this moment where I felt like this channel of energy just like flowed all the way through me, down to my shoes and back up again. And I said to myself, that's not, that's not the, I don't want to do that. And I was very clear, I've earned the right to be here. And we live in a system where other people who would e add equal value to me on the stage are precluded from being there. So I didn't deny the, um, but I also felt like just to default to the critique just perpetuated the binary distinctness, like this thing that we're in. And I said, well, there's bigger issues here than just the, the four of us. And, uh, and so I, I, like one of the questions I asked back to the group is said, how many of you have published an academic paper in coaching? And the woman who asked the question was the only woman in the audience who had published. I said, that's part of the reason why you're not here. So, but part of that is, so what is it, what, is it, what are we doing that's keeping women from publishing? Which are, there are many things that are in the way of that. And so for me, the, the ability to um, not cave in, not attack, not just be with the energy that was, you know, thrown like a lightning bolt down on the stage. And to be in a space where I could find a much deeper truth for me of how I wanted to respond. And could I use that to elevate the conversation, to make space for this woman, Hillary's very legitimate question and a very legitimate uh, frustration with the coaching industry. Um, and say, so can we rise up to include that and create a more generative conversation? And so for me, I realized when we're like in ID, when we're letting go of some of the scaffolding of agendas and curriculums and being in charge and all these things, we've got to have some capacity to hold the energy that those other forms would normally do. And so for me, it, I began to realize that, um, that what you were sharing, Laura, about your experience at your mastermind group. So you're, you're evolving the container that's Laura to be able to do this work. The skills that you, we taught you in narrative coaching will become much more comfortable, powerful, et cetera, et cetera, the more you keep developing yourself. And because the tools are actually quite simple, but they have power because of who you are that brings them. Um, and so we started on this adventure a couple of years ago in the middle of the pandemic um, to begin to figure out how do we pull out the sort of spiritual philosophy of this work and create an experiential program to allow us to um, just really focus on developing ourselves and our capacity to hold space for others. Um, and just one last thing I'll say is we started out the program uh, with another colleague who's um, sort of taking a sabbatical at the moment to deal with some things in our own life. But um, when we started the program, we thought it was going to be uh, another program. And then about halfway through the program, it just sort of like hit me over the head and said, no, we're not, we're not gonna be a program. You can't make us be a program. <laughs> and so uh, Lise and Carolyn and I would meet uh, every couple of weeks. And we sort of realized that NR was our muse. And it was just really calling us in the moment to pay attention to what was called for. And so like a day or two before uh, our next module, which is by no accident happened to be on grief, we, I completely changed the entire program on a dime. And I, the, the last half of the program was extraordinarily beautiful. And so we're just gonna, we're gonna start there this time from the beginning. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna stop there for a minute. And, um, yeah, and, and to see what would be most helpful to you in the context of this framing um, to understand about the program itself. What would be sort of your next round of questions? Or, and Carolyn, you're always, as always, please chime in as well. 
I don't really have uh, questions um, because of my experience in the in the previous programs and having known you and Carolyn uh, for quite a, t a long time. I just trust that it's going to be great and mm -hmm. uh, not just as a consumer, but that I will also be able to contribute to everybody's process, including mine. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason not why I'm here is just because I want to be, I needed to be in, in this space because mm -hmm. I've been working very, very hard and uh, my energy is really high and uh, my body is telling me more and more that I need to literally slow down, but also to bring my energy down to, mm. to be more grounded. And uh, I knew, and I can already feel it in my body that this meeting already would, was going to, to help with that. So, <laughs> yeah. That's good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I love Frau Colleen that you did that a couple of yeah. times, <laughs> and it was your out breath showing itself. Exactly, we really, really work with the out breath. It's the neglected part of the breath cycle. Yeah, yeah. you really go sit there and find its energy and its power, and mm. an integral part of the release. Yeah, yeah, and it was actually my singing teacher that um, alerted me to the fact that. Uh, uh, we had been working on my body as a, an instrument of resonance or, or from head to toe, and it was w going quite well, but uh, I, I just had COVID a month ago, a couple of weeks, uh, not so bad, but uh, it, it's, it's staying in my head, uh, uh, brain fog kind of thing. And uh, I went to my singing class and, and my teacher said, uh, I'm noticing that your breath is only up here, so I need to help you take it back to where it belongs and that was a sort of a wake-up call as well like oh my yeah mm. what what happened that it's like that mm. it's not just covid yeah mm. yeah something sometimes has to bring our attention to the breath mm. doesn't it? and once it's once we're pointing towards it we um we realize we're holding it or we're mm. breathing in a certain way mm. but might be calling us to pay a bit more mm. attention. Yeah. Yeah. Emma, I saw your hand, your hand up. <laughs> I think I was, I was pondering. So uh, there's lots of words that feel, that are making me feel like I'm in the right place. Okay. The thought of, of even just um, your conversation about singing and breath. I'm a singer as well. And Caroline, you talked a little bit about how, how this is really rooted in breath. It just all is making me feel that this is definitely the program for me. Um, mm -hmm. The ID program is fascinating, but for me, there is something mystical and spiritual that feels like this is more my place. I would say if I have any concern, those of you who've come across me in the last few months will probably laugh that I'm hoping that the element of spontaneity in this program is going to suit my somewhat illogical time space conundrum, let's say, where I somewhat struggle always to turn up to everything. There are things that are just non-negotiable and I can be there and I'll be there 200 percent. But I do worry about workload and and I have a a sense that actually just being present in the sessions is perhaps going to be enough although I'm maybe I'm being slightly optimistic and perhaps there will be other work but I'm I'm just sort of wrangling with my sense of I won't be able to I won't be able to handle the workload or I'm going to let myself down <laughs> which is a real a real go-to for me that one hi 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 that narrative um yeah. um so yeah i don't know if you wanted to speak to anything about like the workload and um yeah that's probably it really yeah um yeah so i can share some things and maybe then carolyn can add as well so um you know, like all of us were trained to dutifully show up to things on purpose, right? I've got my plan, I've got my number two pencil, I've got, you know, all the things we were taught to be to be ready. I'm here to learn now. 
And um, narrative beliefs will sort of knock that away pretty quickly <laughs> because you have no idea why you're in the program, really. Um, and the beauty of this for me is there, um, like I said, there will be the most minimal of slides. Um, we'll create some content and we'll borrow from NC and we'll also create some new content around some of the backdrop for this, but we're not actually going to teach it when we're together. So one of the things you'll discover, or you may discover early on is what this journey needs and wants to be about for you. And so um, the assignments will be either personal reflection assignments that you can do or active assignments or um, <clears throat> uh, kind of putting you in some small pods for more sharing. And because there's not a particular destination of you will learn narrative coaching basics, right? And you'll arrive there. The journey will unfold, going back to the quote that uh, Ingrid was uh, trying to bring forward um, from Antonio Mercado, um, that you will find what narrative release, it, how it's serving as a muse for you. And things will come into your life that will provide can, opportunities to explore that and be with that. Um, and we've, uh, the way we've uh, structured the program, there's like three three month uh, sort of themes or kind of uh, main topics. But within that, there's a first, second, and third module in each of those clusters. We don't, because we don't really think of those modules because we're not organized around content per se. Um, but they follow the same sort of um, frame. And so the first month is always about self. And we feel like that is breathing in, like resourcing ourself, becoming more aware of ourself and where's the air going, where's it not going, what's relaxed, what's not relaxed. And, um, and then, uh, so it's just a, uh, awareness of self. And then um, in some ways, the second month is more about um, a couple of skills that might arise, arise from that place. And it's more of a breathing out. Like, how do I want to relax into being in whatever the moment is bringing to me? And then the last one I think of as sort of a sacrament. It's breathing with. How do we stay in that in-out space uh, with others who may not be uh, able to release as well as we are? And so with that comes a releasing from, old, to Robert's point, old narratives that we bump into, and a releasing into and surrendering into new narratives that, that might, might be inviting us. And um, somebody asked me the day the other day something about what what I thought maturity was or how does we were sort of we were sort of commenting on the extraordinary overuse of the word transformation and coaching and with a complete lack of understanding what transformation actually is um and I was I said I just sort of said it was sort of flippant but then I realized it was fairly true that really a lot of things we think are transformative are really just um getting older and paying attention <laughs> And they're, they're, um, and so the beginning, uh, the unfolding of kind of what's trying to happen in your life with yourself, um, we're just sort of creating a, using breath literally and figuratively as a rhythm to help you kind of start to pay attention to in this phase of your life, you know, so, you know, Fuckland, I've known you for what, seven or eight years. So this is, uh, yeah, there's a there's a rising and falling pattern I observe in your life of, you know, down and oh, and down and oh, you know, and so, and now you think, oh, now I bumped into that again, but now I want to approach it differently, or I now want to see it in a new way, or maybe there's some softening of that pattern, maybe I don't have to do, do that. Um, and, you know, and the thing that about Carolyn and I is we're not here to teach you this. We're in on the same journey that you're on. Right, I mean, we laugh and talk about that every time we get together, and it's really just creating a series of experiences that you can engage in to serve your own journey, and um, even more so than in the other uh, two uh, programs. And you may discover in um, in um, 
reverence for yourself, like you say, Emma, that there might be a phase in the program where you drift away for a while because that's what you need to be doing. And we'll just send you up our blessings and say, go and come back in a few weeks or whatever. Or, and then, um, and, and I think for me, it, it, it's really allowing us to, at some fundamental level, relax into the reality of ourself mm -hmm. more and um, be more at peace, be more accepting, be more loving. Um, and, um, and I just find that when we do that with some structure, then it allows us to not only do that for ourselves, but to hold space for others so they can do the same. It's sounding like a a structure for another level, a layer of awareness. Yeah. Um, the the comments about breath and singing. Um, I was blessed to train with a a singing instructor who, amongst other things, did opera as well as other stage work. And um, she identified a sound in my voice that she felt was forced, but it took a couple encounters of her focus to identify that I was singing from the very back of my throat. And the reason for that is a kid, I listened to my own voice compared to all the adults singing around me and I was uh, unhappy with my child's voice. So hmm. I was back there trying to create this <laughs> adult voice. <laughs> and so he said, I don't know if we're gonna be able to coach you out of that by the end of the class. I was in a group class at that point. So we met a couple times privately and Initially, we had planned to work with it for longer, anticipating. But as soon as, pretty much as soon as I became aware of it, I was able to shift my voice into the mid chamber, not by my teeth, but also not way back in the throat. And it totally changed my delivery voice and my breathing. And just, just that piece rippled out into my life mm. it, it shifted a lot of stuff mm. and uh, i realized i had grown up in the era where women were supposed to have tight, tight waists and i did and i was trained not to breathe fully because your belly stuck out and you're supposed mm. to keep that belly tight and you know corseted even without the actual corset and so there there it was a, a huge thing with that mm. um and I'm I'm feeling tantalized um, by what you've described, David. Of mm. you know, kind of a like getting in the flotation tank mm -hmm. of of awareness. Thank you. Mm. Well, I love that indigo. It makes me just come round to the power of the narrative and, and the embodiment as you describe it, as you express yourself through voice and how powerful it is to become a coach or someone who holds space for others who can notice that in a client or in another, in a person that we mm -hmm. care about, that if we can hear and sense and feel the resonance and the the tightnesses and the contractions and the, and the way that the yeah the the whatever we're holding is held cellularly mm -hmm. and if, we, if we can begin to make those gentle observations to others then a coaching conversation becomes much quieter much slower and probably much more powerful for the person who's showing up to it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
he also um, wasn't judgmental. You know, he wasn't saying, you know, mm. it was bad to do that. It was mm. just, this is what you're doing. And um, she gave me that space also because she di did up front say, it may take some time. So don't, you know, don't get upset about this. It gave me that permission to relax into whatever time it took. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I really relate to about narrative coaching is you don't have that overlaid structure, you know, in the first couple sessions, oh, this is what we're going to do. And this is what will happen because that's what we're doing. But it's, it's you're allowed to unfold you're like a flower. You don't rip open the petals and say, we, you know, we got to get here. You know, we've only got so many sessions left. Bah, open up. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. you, you're just allowed to, to unfold as, as it organically presents. And that's what makes so much sense to be about the narrative coaching principles, mm. ID, narrative release. Thanks, Indigo. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got thoughts or questions for us? Any place where this is taking you that you want to notice? It's, it's reminding me of one of the exercises we did uh, when we were together in Radstock, um, mm -hmm. which was, a, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if there's, this is an exercise that draws on the whole concept of narrative or the whole principle of narrative release. Uh, it was an exercise you encouraged me and Barbara, lovely Irish Barbara, to mm -hmm. take part in, where I think I was initially seated and there was something that was feeling I think there was something that was feeling sticky or un, unclear and David you encouraged Barbara to walk around me mm -hmm. and and if I remember I was breathing and as as she came to certain places in that circumference if I felt a change in my breath if I felt any mm -hmm. somatic change we were to talk about it. And I don't think there was even the invitation to particularly explain what I was feeling. It was just a, can you stop? That's a thing, that's a something. And I really remember there was a feeling when she was coming around and there was a moment, it was really interesting if I remember there was this wonderful coincidence because there aren't coincidences <laughs> where suddenly the kitchen was making loads of noise yeah. and there was some kind of pots and pots <laughs> being bashed. And I just had this massive moment of like, oh, that's a really overwhelming feeling. Mm. And overwhelm is a huge thing for me. And she was there and she was just kind of coming into my view. And there was this sense of kind of looming and overwhelm and, and it was just it was a very it was an incredibly powerful exercise mm. and i i haven't um it it didn't sit with with the narrative coaching that we were learning and so i was already thinking oh i wonder if that comes from some other part of one of the programs that you teach and i would be so interested in digging into that because it was such a somatic um experience mm. uh, that and don't even get me started on chairs no, it's all about the chairs. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, post-it notes. I haven't even got oh, I have got post-it notes. Post-it notes and chairs. So, um, so yeah. So, I'm assuming that it would be that kind of thing, or or, or things yes. in that kind of realm that we might be touching on. Yes. So, I'm I'm uh, working on a paper at the moment around. Um, kind of rethinking how do we create masterful coaches and in that we which is um, in most like in ICF and other languages it's really about competency or uh, but it really isn't about <clears throat> I said that I'm this sort of thing I'm writing a paper about mastery and maturity and mystery mm -hmm. and that's three things to uh, learn to excel at if you will uh, in um, 
developing yourself as a coach. Um, yeah, and so a lot of the um, pieces that we introduced at the retreat, um, our first sort of experiment with the live program in a while, so that was really quite interesting to watch, um, is really about, in some ways, the mystery part, the part that we can't see. And, you know, and then even in some of the stories that some of you used to check in, there's you there's a sense of something, a need or a awareness, but you can't quite find it or you can't quite name it or what is that? And, um, you know, so in Indigo, your, your teacher, you know, bringing language to this experience you were having about your voice. And, and, and so mm -hmm. I think particularly in this time when so much feels uncertain and unknown, even some of the places we might traditionally go to help ourselves get clear don't seem as clear as they maybe once were. And so, Every time, every uh, session, every sort of module and session we have has an underpinning. So like in the first uh, one, we're going to have a few experiences that we can, we can draw from indigenous wisdom, not because we're teaching you indigenous wisdom, but because they know some really cool things about how to ground oneself in land. And, um, and so we're just going to bring resources sort of as an underpinning for you to be feel supported and having experiences. And then sort of like stringing pearls on a string where you just you know, bring these experiences and, and then kind of seeing what patterns are emerging, what they seem to be moving towards. And then ultimately, as um, we do more of this, you'll start to recognize when a client brings you something like, oh, I've been here before. We, 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 we talked about this or I had that experience for myself. And so you start having... Um, uh, the capacity to just receive whatever's coming from the client because you've traveled those roads enough here on your own to, okay, I can do this. Um, and part of the ability of like in nerve coaching to use silence is the ability to quiet yourself and, and the urge to go be helpful <laughs> um, or to have things be different or better or somewhere else. And, and so a lot of, the, and this is, I think, one of the really the great strengths that Carolyn brought to the program was a lot of background in breathing. And I've been doing it all my life. I know. Well, I have too, but badly, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but you can can, can I you, just say something here, David, yeah, to come along beside you? Um, you, you when you talked about, you know, oh, I've been here before, or didn't we have mm. this conversation? With, with a client who's circling back to something something's coming up in their unconscious that wants mm -hmm. to have another go might the coach see this might the coach be able to notice me I want to come in and it, it just took me to the sort of image of me before narrative coaching where I'd have been checking back in my notes to see if I was right because that would be important then mm -hmm. but actually in a session now it would be all about it's not happening in my head. It's like, oh, I feel this feeling again, or my breath mm. is doing something familiar, or, oh, why am I feeling this? Um, you know, the gestalt of it, if you use that language. Mm. So you're really using your body to remember. And, and yeah, or you're like, why am I holding my breath? What is going? I mean, there's a lot in the throat mm. um, and in the voice. You know, there's a lot that goes on for people who think about chakras. They'll have a language and a conceptual piece there. And in a way, we don't really want to teach you any of those different apparatuses. It's just, you know, what are you noticing? Mm. Mm. Yeah. And if we're lucky, we might be useful, but we need to give up the idea of being helpful, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I just want to go back to something else that you made me think might be useful to surface from, from your, your, what you were saying about the retreat, and I was remembering it too, um, that we're really into the field in this program. You know, mm -hmm. it's about, it, it, we want to notice more of it, notice 
what we're in, notice what wants to be named or surfaced or felt or moved, um, the sort of mystery side of the of the piece, David. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're very interested in field work, whatever mm -hmm. you will call it, whatever. I mean, David and I have different languages for things, mm -hmm. right? We're different bodies, we've lived different lives, but we meet at a certain point and that's the place we want to meet with you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And you will, and if you're like our first year, you will keep circling back around and bumping into yourself again. And I'm thinking about at the retreat, there were two of our ever so lovely participants who spent the entire last morning making long lists of things they were going to do as a result of the retreat. <laughs> completely absurd to me, complete. But they were, and they were complaining, they were running out of time and paper because their lists were so long. But then I thought, okay, so this, they, they're completing this cycle. This yeah. as far as they could get on this cycle. But mm. it, the glory of the program is that unlike a retreat, which ends after a fixed period of time, is you have nine months to mm -hmm. like, oh, here I am making lists again. Oh, that part of me seems to want to come and play. What if I like let it quiet, be quiet for a while? What else could I do uh, uh, to actually confront my, maybe my fear of endings? So I create lists to mute my feelings of whatever that comes up for me when something's almost over. And rather than Noting maybe it's a sense of grief or loss, or rather than dealing with that, I'm just going to make lists. And so you go, oh, look at that. I made lists again. And then you kind of go into the next module, and here goes the article. Oh, here I am again. Well, maybe I can make a shorter list, right? Maybe I'll make a, then maybe I'll just identify one thing I'll do. And then maybe by the fourth or fifth circle, you go, oh, screw this list. <laughs> I'm just going to be with how I feel. And so you, you um, what we find is that even though it, it's a linear sequence of modules, because that's the way time goes and the way things like this are structured, that a lot of your time will be spent in circles. Um, just re, re see, seeing new parts of yourself, seeing old situations in new ways, just kind of keep returning to um, what's the next layer of this that I can notice now? Mm. Yeah. So when do you, you think that doing potentially so might sorry. I jump I jumped. My bad. <laughs> I was gonna say I was gonna make a joke and say that maybe my inability to wrangle the time space continuum may have finally found its true home in a place <laughs> that actually doesn't exist in a time space continuum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're a, we all, you all get a complimentary flux capacitor when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was wondering a little bit when when you were going like this that like the the going around, but like again, I keep. I mean, I am so drawn to the spiral mm -hmm. um, image. Um, it was something that I've always sort of had before I met the Moment Institute. And now it's just sort of like, blah, you know, all over the place. And, um, but I got thinking about, and when you talk about mystery and, you know, I brought that quote about the no, no path, just mm -hmm. the willing walk, those who are willing to walk. And is the mystery and the, like the story self and the unstory self is the un am I am I thinking am I making some link correctly or incorrectly or whatever that the unstory self is that mystery like is mm -hmm. is that the place well yeah the emergent place of I, I mean whatever and like I'm just trying to think of there's so many words and yet I'm such a mm -hmm. feeler a body I'm so in my body uh, oftentimes to the point of not always helpful when I need a rational mm. moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, but there's something that just feels like this is um, like, I've, uh, you know, as you read, you look at that word mystery, right? Like I I'm, think about it quite often and I've just been into Sharon Blackie's work um, mm. 
Um, and she has this new book out, Hagitude. So I think it's really fun, mm. <laughs> fun to play around cute. with. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just sort of thinking about mystery in that way. Yeah. In the field, right? Like, um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, part of the discipline around mystery is just not attaching uh a, a meaning or, or meaning meaning or sense to things as if that were the truth of it um yeah and you'll discover many carolyn's and many david's and how do they want to be together and um we were sharing a, a certain anecdote on monday about a david that showed up in a conversation that was really pissing me off and um, because I thought, oh, I thought I, I thought that David had grown up by now, but apparently not. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and but then I, but then rather than judging that or judging the other person that was activating this in me, I thought, just like we do in narrative coaching, well, this is really interesting that this David would show up in this story at this time in this particular setting. It would have been a not, it would have been not helpful for me at all if I reacted from that David, because that would have been sort of not productive for me in a big way, but I had to sit with, so that David wants a seat at the table in this conversation, I wonder why. And what I started to realize in the, um, by holding it more gently, I could see that it actually, even though it was coming across as demanding and whining or whatever, it was actually it causing me, it invited me to wake up that there was a political element to the conversation I had been not paying attention to or kind of brushed aside. And its tantrum was really just like, hey, you better pay attention to this because if you don't, you're not going to get what you want from the situation. And so the ability to just like notice that self, love that self, ask myself, why is that self showing up now? Figuring out what to do with that self all in the space of like three or four minutes. And so what you start to realize is you just get more, these spirals just get you more and more familiar with your own cast of characters, your own dynamics. Like, and here we go. Here's this one again. Like, what is this one doing here? Uh, what purpose into Carolyn's distinction? Um, you know, what's, what's useful in this for me right now? Yeah. Um, and we just find it just creates so much more fluidity in what we can bring of ourself and with our clients because we're not attached to an original meaning or interpretation or anything. Yeah. And so that mystery then is just being willing to be in that, trusting as we always do, that everything we need is right in front of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to add in a little bit yeah. because we haven't spoken about, about it as yet and it may not be important to folk, but there's something about practice here. Mm -hmm. For me, the kind of the commitment that we make to practice, whatever that means for you, some people would say take that as a spiritual practice or a meditation mm -hmm. practice. But actually, you know, so what did you practice today? Oh, quite a lot of anger, quite a lot of hysteria, quite a lot of not feeling very in control. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're practicing all the time. Um, and it seems to me that practicing neutrality is a really interesting challenge. Uh, it is not, I mean, I'm just taking the lid off this one very quietly over here. It's, it's a lot of the things that I would say get invited in in a space like this are really lifelong practices, lifelong mm -hmm. experiments and explorations. And some you'll already be in and some will be new to you possibly, or the language may be different. There's something about, for me, for me, about having a space to practice whether it's breathing, neutrality, surrender, you know, trusting the mystery, mm. being with the quiet and, and having a space to practice with others who, mm. who are in this, uh, on the, uh, you know, walking the path of no path. Mm. So, you know, you'll have time to work together in small groups. Um, the, the, the sessions will, will be very spontaneous. They'll mm. be it'll be very experiential mm. Mm. i'm i'm finding myself taking a lot of deep breaths during this conversation like trying to take all of this in i think and um something that's come up that, that 
Do you do you remember the game or the toy, the Spirograph? Oh yeah. Um. That's what's okay. I started drawing a circle, and normally when I do that, it kind of goes right into the middle and stops. And this time it just kept going around and around and getting bigger and then smaller and it crossed over each other. And the word that came up for me was spirograph. Like it's, mm. it's, it's not, it's infinity. It's not, it doesn't have a beginning and an end, right? It's just, mm -hmm. it's swirling. And then I wrote, wrote down underneath it, uh, this arrow, like the straight line with an arrow and then get somewhere like this story that we tell each other is that we have to, or at least I tell myself is that I need to get somewhere that that linear progression like learn something add on to it learn something else add on to it and finally I arrive somewhere versus this spirograph thing where it's looping back going forward going around um picking up where I left off remembering something adding to that but then discarding something else and it so it's it's you know I, I'm thinking when we invented time we kind of messed ourselves up because it's we don't learn that way we don't experience life that way like yeah. it's it doesn't work and th and then what you were saying carolyn about noticing and checking in and and uh, practice the word practice struck mm -hmm. me it's it's like yoga or anything else like it's not about perfecting it and go, okay i've got this now now i get to go, go do something else it's it's a continuous looping around and practicing and experiencing experiencing not getting it right it's it's about mm -hmm. experiencing stuff and then noticing it and like so yeah it's it completely shifting right now my kind of ex understanding of where i need to get to versus yeah. how i want to experience my day and you know going to what robert was talking about like i've had this feeling of time's running out like i i need to like i like it's now or never kind of thing. Like I got to get some stuff done and, you know, um, you know, I'm not done yet. And all of that stuff, like that sense of urgency around time. Mm. And now I'm sort of, and I think these breaths are the fact that I'm slowing myself going down. Hold on a second. It's not about that at all. It, it, just allowing that spiral to take me places, but not, um, I was just saying, not relinquishing totally control, but maybe that's another story I need to look at. Too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, maybe it's turtles, all, it's turtles all the way down. Yeah, yeah. It's all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, I could see somebody spending at least nine months exploring the embodiment of that in relation to the embodiment of, I mean, I was really like with your body and thinking, wow, that for me, my breathing changed quite significantly because it tightened when you did that. And then when you did that, it was like, ah, oh, yeah, how amazing. What a, what a huge journey it would be just to shift from one to the other of those modes. Well, and then I go to how much I love roller coasters and rides and you know that that thrill of that experience of being moved around in different directions and uh -huh. dropped and kicked up and spun around and all that like and that's a total embodiment embodiment thing but mm -hmm. um but there's still an element of control because it's a machine right so I, i'm trusting that the machine's not going to drop me um so this, there's a different level of trust here that mm -hmm. I'm experiencing that, that it's, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's hard for me to find the words right now, but it's, there's something, there's a trust element here somewhere too, that um, in the practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is an incredibly rich conversation for me mm. because it occurs to me that this narrative release is precisely what I've been looking for as a, an avenue into spirit, into mm. what is that, to explore the mystery. That a lot of my thought recently has been about the paradox of beyond the binary. Mm. How do we get beyond the binary that we're, we're programmed into, uh, that we are in, in the words of the process philosophy, 
we're thrown into it without choice, without much of consultation of whether we like it or not, or whether we think it's a good idea or whatever, that here we are in this material world and it has its rules and it has its pain and its costs. And there you go, now what? And here we are as this eternal spiritual being caught up in this, in this, <laughs> now what? That's the eternal question. And the answer is that we relax and create it. Mm. That's one of the answers. I mean, that's the answer that's occurring here. That uh, and the breath is is incredibly important. That um, this is this is a this is a, a, a. I love quotes. Apparently, we all love quotes. Uh, <laughs> many of us do. And uh, this is uh, my a lot of my understanding. <laughs> a lot of my understanding comes from my experience in, in the 12-step philosophy and my experience as a drug addict and my training as an addiction counselor. I was a certified addiction counselor uh, also and drawing all of those experiences, um, there's a, 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 a physician who's one of the big guns in uh, trauma therapy and addiction of the healing of addiction and the healing of trauma. And what is that and how do you do that? And his name is Bessel van der Kolk. Mm. Yeah. Some of you are familiar with that name. Uh, he's one of those people that are bringing uh, spirituality and science together. And this is, this is uh, what he writes about trauma and its psychological consequences. It is not a mental disease, but an adaptation. And Bessel van der Kolk says, the brain disease model overlooks four fundamental truths. One, our capacity to destroy one another is matched by our capacity to heal one another. Restoring relationships and community is central to restoring well being. Two, language gives us the power to change ourselves and others by communicating our experience, helping us to define what we know and finding a common sense of meaning. Three, we have the ability to regulate our own physiology, including some of the so-called involuntary functions of the body and brain through such basic activities as breathing, moving, and touching. And four, we, we can change social conditions to create environments in which children and adults can feel safe and where they can thrive. Mm. When we, and the commentator who shared this quote with me uh, in writing says, when we ignore these quintessential dimensions of humanity, we deprive people of ways to heal from trauma and restore their autonomy. Being a patient rather than a participant in one's healing process separates suffering people from their community and alienates them from an inner sense of self. So that the quote that follows that is the one from the unguru or the, the non the anti-guru Jiddu Krishnamurti, who says that uh, being well adjusted to a pathological, to a deeply pathological society is no measure of well-being. <laughs> so that's that's yeah. uh, which while trying to be normal when normal is real fucked up. Yeah. That's, a, yeah. that's a trick, huh? Mm. Thank you, Robert. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I always say I'm the only normal person in the world. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> that's, <your friend. laughs> that's a terrible, that's a terrible thing about it. Mm. Annoying. Is is uh what's her name? Uh Gloria Steinem, that great warrior for, for social justice, said. The truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know, I was thinking, Laura, what you were sharing of, you know, the, you know, so Laura's part of a pilot we're doing with this platform around giving each other feedback. And I was thinking about, you know, the journey you're on with some of the decisions, that, you know, this urgency that you're feeling and describing and um, this sort of, how it's easy for any of us to get attached to a, a glimpse of that circling 
oh, this must be the truth. Oh, I've got to do this. And it just I'm just in watching a couple of those sessions, watching you start to circle the, these big decisions you're trying to make and realize, oh, there's a lot, there's a number of layers here. There's a number of perspectives. There's, there's no, it's not a linear progression to the answer, right? It's a murky human encounter with many variables and uh, many, many good choices and many, you know, and so I think it's, um, and building on what you were saying, Robert, it's it, a lot of this is just allowing yourself to be um, more at peace with just being humans, yeah. right? And we, and I, I, one of the, I, 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 I may or may not dare myself to do this as one of your assignments, but I'm thinking like, what if we'd like to have like a, a whole week where we made absolutely no effort to change ourselves? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, Laura's already, just breathe, Laura, it's fine. It, it won't be in, in, in the that, first that month today, but if that one comes in, that might be, be the graduating bit. exercise. <laughs> But like, what if, like, what if we lived a whole, this, it sounds so absurd, but to your point, Robert, like, what if we just like stopped trying so hard to become better? Yes. Not because that's the ultimate aim, because, you know, improving yourself is a noble pursuit, but I said, you know, sometimes that may, I feel, be counterproductive. And what if we could just experience ourselves doing nothing mm. and just being like, and and like and and so one of the things we'll do, I know we'll do a lot in the program is allowing yourself some thought experiments. Like, what if I never changed ever again, and I was exactly this way for the rest of my life? And then just watch what happens. Tears. And so again, there's the image I keep coming back to is like um, uh, moving through water. You know, there's a flow to this that we're trying to bring, and noticing where's our water stopped up namely our breath or our movement. Um, where is it seeking release to move and flow in some different directions? And it's the beauty of water. It just goes where it needs to go. And whatever is in its way, even if it's a piece of granite, it'll just keep coming and coming and coming until it'll erode a channel for it to get. Um, and I think uh, Paulo uh, Kulo or something said something about, you know, a river only has one purpose, to get to the sea. <laughs> And um, yeah, so. I like what you're saying about uh, the experiment of uh, <clears throat> not wanting to change for, for a week. Um, and ex yeah, it's an exercise I've been doing ever since I, I uh, healed from COVID with my brain fog. As you know, my brain is usually quite quick and um, I can't do the quickness now. And it's it was frustrating at the beginning because I have to accomplish a lot of things in a short space of time now and I can't manage so I'm running behind things all the time which is frustrating so last week I thought why don't I try to accept my brain is like this for now and uh, that whatever I can manage to do uh, that'll be it mm -hmm. and um, there's nothing more I can do and that will have to be good enough mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I'm not completely managing, but it's it starts to, to work, and now in a, in fact it frees up uh, time mm. and energy because I'm not trying so hard. Mm. And uh, people come to me now because they see that I'm struggling, and can I help you with something, or mm. maybe you do this, or and so help is there. Um, so it's really mm. funny uh, experience, not completely new, but yeah, like whatever life throws at you just accept and then uh, work with that yeah good yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, yeah one of the lovely things about the way this space works i think is that there's there's a very deep invitation into the what is mm. yeah. it feels a deeper one to me at any rate than mm -hmm. than there's time for in a way in nc and as you were speaking, Franklin, I was just thinking again, I was going back to the question around how we are with clients. And if we can practice not changing for a week, it, how might that help us sit with others and not expect them to change or see our job as helping mm. them change? Yeah. You know, the, what then is in the field if we're just there with them 
and that's both scary and very astonishing mm. as a thought. So yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about maybe this idea. Sorry. No, it's just uh, maybe a joke. I'm in the accelerated coaching uh, lab, mm. <laughs> so maybe I'll try that question. Yeah, <laughs> great. Like, what if this is just fine? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Laura. Um, I was just thinking about what you said about what if I never need to change and then more at peace with being human. So then I thought, well, what's human mean? Um, but this idea of never changing, like this idea of slowing down, like the breath, slowing down pace and um, how everything is like the world is sped up. And then I thought, what COVID has done is like brought everything to a grinding halt almost. So it's, it's asking us in some way, shape or form to slow down. Mm. Um, and it brought to mind this, I'll just share a story. When I was younger, I marched in a drum and bugle corps, which was a very kind of paramilitary kind of thing. Like, you know, there was um, drill sergeants and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I spun a rifle and, you know, so there was, is a very, um, yeah, a command kind of thing. Like you, as a rifle sergeant, I commanded, I or like you know, pe to, to start marching and to move and all of that stuff. Um, and we marched to music. There was horns and drums and all of that stuff. Um, but there was also a time where we put together this color guard with no music, and the the test was to do a whole performance in a gym without music. So there was nothing there to help us pace, mm. had to pace ourselves. And um, part of the rules around this was you had to cross over this line to get started and you had to cross over that line to finish. And if you didn't cross over the line, you didn't finish. Therefore, you couldn't, you couldn't win an award. You failed, basically. So what happened was without the music and because we were nervous and performing and so on, there was 12 of us and the pace started getting faster and faster and, and we couldn't control it. And it just getting faster and faster and faster. So like it was frenetic. And we ended up short of the line by about 10 feet because we were moving so fast, our steps were small. But it was this idea of, of needing that constant beat, something to keep us in rhythm, something mm. to keep us um, not mm. speeding up so fast. And I'm wondering about this, beat like what is it about something that helps us keep regulated keeps not regulated yeah. it, um versus getting frenetic and fast-paced and and then you know realizing oh my god i've done that again and i've missed the line by 10 feet again <laughs> like mm -hmm. um, so i'm wondering about the beat like how do we what is that that's a great, think, great story, great analogy. It, it is a great analogy, and it, it, it illustrates for me that it, another thing I've been deeply looking into is that the, the answer to most things is the heart, that the yeah. heart is not a pump. The heart is the second brain, that mm. as many nerve impulses go from the brain, from the heart to the brain, more impulses go from the heart to the brain than go from the brain to the heart. So in some sense, yeah. Uh, our hearts control our brain and that we don't really pay attention to that so much for a lot of reasons, but who, who cares? So the, the point being that the embodied, the embodied spirit is the only real spirit that the Buddhists say, if it's not practical, it's not spiritual doesn't matter how noble and how elevated and, and, and spiritual something sounds. If it's not useful in my life, it's just a concept and it's useless to me because I have no access to it. It's just a nice idea. So mm -hmm. this notion of being heart-centered is crucial. And this the, the idea that there are many, many Davids, many Carolyn's, many Roberts. Which one is the right one for this moment? And the answer is none of them. That the right, authentic, 
person for this moment is the one that I create because when I'm singing my song, when I'm living my life, I am not coming from a place of this is the right song to sing. I'm coming from a place of expressing what life needs, what the field needs to be present in that moment because it doesn't exist otherwise. The past and the future are concepts. They do not exist. We live our lives as though they were real. That's the real reality. The past and the future are the real reality. And what's happening now is this kind of foggy dream, but that's bass backwards. Mm. I love jokes because there's such a, it's a nice way to say that with some of the truths and it's a mystery of time is that time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. <laughs> you just couldn't resist, could you, Robert? You just had to get that in there. <laughs> had to. Had to. Couldn't help it. Yeah. Um. So we're kind of go ahead, Carolyn. Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to kind of come in on the wave of the heartbeat there, that that and, and and to speak also to what Laura, what you're talking about is, we you know where are these fundamental beats of life, and in a way, what can I trust? Because we know heartbeats speed up and slow down. We know that hearts get diseased. We, you know, and there's you know in the heart lung complex, there is a really beautiful relationship between breath and heartbeat. So breath is also a beat. And if you really practice, you can feel the cellular beats as the water, the liquid moves into cellularly. So the, the body is full of rhythms that are part of the everything of nature, if you like. And there are lots of different, different beats that, that we might want to tune into. Um, and then, you know, they beat in relation, David, I'm reminded of you and I sitting at the retreat doing the back to back, yes. heart. you know, you sit back to back with somebody else and you feel their heart in your heart. So there's kind of the body as a cell and it sort of speaks to Bessel van der Kolk and some and many of the others, you know, the heart beats in a self regulating system, but it, a lot of healing I think lives in co-regulation and relation mm -hmm. relational experience yeah mm. yeah I'm a choir conductor and in a way the assignment you were given Laura sounds a little bit odd because I think if you give people the instruction you have to be between the lines and do this and get there you're sort of getting out of your body, like what, what we we're all talking about. You don't connect with your natural rhythm of yourself. You cannot, you, you don't tune in with each other. You just individually together go to somewhere and then you start speeding up. Mm -hmm. And even in my choir, I'm, uh, I was also going to say, um, the group needed a conductor just to <laughs> <laughs> give the beat quietly. <laughs> But that would have been too easy because I noticed my choir members will also speed up if, if they're uh, mm. singing up here, for example, or if they're not tuning in with the rest of the group, for example. Mm. Yeah, so they, there's a lot about embodying it and, and tuning mm. into each other rather than achieving something. Mm. We just have a couple more minutes. I'm just really curious if there's any more questions that people want to bring while we're all here still. And um... I just felt it was great to be here and to, like Laura, <laughs> feel my breath expand yeah. and yeah, mm. sink. <laughs> In a way, mm. thank you for that mm. sharing space together. Mm. Yeah, I want to say it's a conversation that 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 ha hasn't sped up. You know, a lot of conversations when they get going get speedy. Mm -hmm. 
what I love about sitting in the MI space is they tend to stay quite spacious. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> mm. All right. So Lynn, I think we have a conversation on Fridays or Saturday, or do we have something I think scheduled? Yeah, mute. Oh, sorry, I didn't. You were talking to me. Yes, we have. A, I I set up a time with you to, for tomorrow. You're tomorrow, yes, that's a, great. So we can pick up any more questions you have about this if if, if that's what you want to talk about. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm, great. Any any final parting words of wisdom, Carolyn? <laughs> I know you have oh, so many to choose. It's a from. very ongoing process. I don't think there's any finality to any of it. For just this moment of time, to finish this moment well, of time. Well, you know, just just lovely to hear a little bit more about where everybody is. And, mm. uh, and you know, it, it's so interesting to see when the screen was a little fuller with with those who've who've parted that each of you would come if you chose to join us with a very different story behind you and a very different kind of pull in or calling into this kind of space the nine months mm -hmm. of the year. Um, and that's really what we want it to be like. It, we, you know, the David always stresses that it's not about doing it the way he does it. And this is even less about doing it the way anybody does it, isn't it? You know, in, in contrast to MC and ID, it's it's really um, it's a lot of individuation here. And um, yeah. yeah. I'll just piggyback on that. Sorry. I was just going to say, you said there's a lot of individuation here, but I feel like there's also a lot of co-creation here so it's kind of mm. both yeah, yeah well the, I, one, I, the one would be in the other if we saw them as an, antithetical mm. we would have to see the yin and the yang and the yang yang and the yin we'd have to acknowledge the one that is in the other i think in some way but yeah i agree with you it's deeply relational this work I, i'm a little skeptical about self-regulation as a concept mm. You know, I mean, I do work in that way with people, but actually the relational is really important. So thank you for naming mm -hmm. that. Well, I was just thinking how people go off to like a cabin in the woods or something to find themselves. Um, there's not, there's a piece missing in that and they, they're missing something about the connection. I mean, their connection to the environment and so on, yeah. but there's still the social piece that's missing. So. That's yeah. where I was thinking when you said in individuation that there's that a part of it is in the group, that social piece, that connection yeah. piece. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, mm. thanks for learning that. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's also about the being and the being together uh, and then connected to doing. But uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and being together with not a lot to do in a, in a way, you know, there, were, there won't be 30 slides, there won't be yeah. a lot of tasks. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, thank you for your time and creating such a beautiful space together. And um, I look forward to seeing you in whatever program you choose for next year. And um, thank you, Carolyn, for um, it's, it's a fun journey to be on uh, with this work with narrative release. So I'm looking forward to starting this again. So, yeah, me too. Yeah. Thank Good you for offering. You. Yeah, be time. well. Yeah. Thank you for offering ah. the <laughs> program. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much. Yeah. When will we hear whether, whether or not we've been admitted? Uh, being on the waiting list <laughs> uh, um well I'll, I'll have to ask emily that i don't know All right. i would have somebody would have already been told that but um probably not so <laughs> i'll check in with her and see where we're at with that yeah no rush. i wouldn't have thought it would be much longer if you're waiting 
No, no, it's, there is no, yeah, anyway, so um, I'll, I'll get, I'll get to Emily about that. I have, I have the last question that I have is that uh, you mentioned an appointment with um, one of, I, I, now I'm going blank. Laura, Laura that um, for a conversation and whether it's with you or one of, one of your senior coaches, uh, it seems that maybe I should do that, that is my next phase because when I get into a space like this, I sort of automatically go into uh, a different mode than what mm -hmm. I need. Uh, a focus on what's practical and what do I need to do? And I sort of get thrown into this spacious comfort of, of camaraderie and connection mm -hmm. that is, it, the, the, the paradox is that we need to go beyond the binary and that our, the binary is what we've got. That is, that is my life, is yeah. spiritual and animal. Mm -hmm. And the, the negotiating the path between those two is not optional. That's what I got. But the path of the animal is what's difficult. And how do I, I'm having a hard time negotiating that. Maybe if I'm not in that, this space of, of, of mutual spaciousness, where I get pulled into that lovely connection place, where it's hard for me to see what is the problem. Because there really is no problem when I'm in the field. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no, that's not a place for problems. That's a place for joy and, and celebration or guidance, but I'm not at that place where I can get the, di the, the differentiation, where I have the discrimination to, to hear the advice that's for me, for the guidance that's for me and not for everybody. And maybe, I don't know, maybe that's the problem. Is that my, the guidance for everybody is the same as for me, but maybe not, because I'm unique. And how do I get past that uniqueness to become like normal? Okay. So I need to make I need an appointment for for further coaching. Uh, is that available? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Right. So I get. So you can either uh, find you can either set up an appointment on the website with me. You can uh, email Carolyn if you want to talk to her more about this program, or uh, or you can even yeah, you can reach out to um, yeah. It, 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 whatever would serve, serve you best. Okay, let me let me let me meditate on that. Let me see yes. which which one would be appropriate. So I'm, when you drop when you drop back out of the spaciousness of the call, back to into yourself, <laughs> see what feels true to you. Yes, something like that. Yeah. However, that works. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Be well, folks. Adios. Bye. 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 Bye.